Hello. Hello and welcome. Hello. I am just waiting for everyone's screens to load on my screen. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. I don't know who Hi, said everybody. that. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I just see a bunch of cool writer people. <laughs> I see. Jim, hi Jim. And the tall. Ruth, Naomi, Judy in San Diego. Megan, San Diego. Marco, hi. <laughs> Buddy. Some folks from the Bay Area. Awesome. Ricardo. All right. Here. <laughs> so um, welcome everybody to Poets and Writers virtual town hall meeting for California. This is our second meeting in a series of three. And uh, today we are shifting the focus um, to presenting uh, virtual live readings. Um, last week we focused on our new temporary guidelines for funding virtual live literary events. So I'll go over that a little bit today. And then we're gonna have um, a wonderful uh, guest speaker and time for some questions and answers and discussion. Um, I believe my associate, uh, Dan Tran, uh, is going to share with everybody a very brief agenda in the chat window. Uh, just a few little tips uh, for Zoom. You can open the chat. Uh, all the controls are at the bottom of your screen. And if you open the chat, that gives you a place to type questions you might have for discussion. Uh, if you open the participants window you can see all of the people who are participating in the meeting you'll see their names and this is important for discussion you will be able to raise your hand using a control in that participants window or lower your hand so i think we're going to try to use that for the q a period so that i can a little bit more easily manage the discussion and call on people with their hands raised um, so I hope everybody can figure that out. <laughs> um, I'll, I can't remember if I introduced myself, but I am Jamie Asai Fitzgerald, and I am the director of Poets and Writers California office and our Readings and Workshops West program. Um, I'm here today with my co-host, Dan Tran Kong Wen. She is our Readings and Workshops McCrindle Foundation Fellow. And also with us from our um, Readings and Workshops program is Ricardo Hernandez um, sitting in on the meeting and he is um, working in our New York office um, managing the program for both me and uh, New York and some of our cities. So welcome, we're, <laughs> thumbs up for Ricardo, yay. Um, we're really glad you could make it. Um, it's great to see your faces. Um, the Readings and Workshops Mini Grants Program has been funding literary events for 50 years in New York and 30 years in California. And due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had to make some adjustments. We decided that because we can't fund live events because they're not happening. <laughs> we, we would temporarily approve funding for virtual live events. Um, by doing, making this change, we can keep supporting writers and keep supporting organizations that want to produce literary events. And um, that's really important. We want 
you all to keep it going and we want to be able to uh, foster uh, those kinds of experiences for the community. Um, so the other reason um, why we made that change is because we know that writers are facing great hardship right now. And even though our grants are really small, um, they, can, they can make a difference um, in a writer's life, um, pay for some groceries, um, utilities, rent, all of that good stuff. So um, the new guidelines for live virtual events are on our website. I'm not gonna go through all of the guidelines with you today because I wanna make sure we have time uh, to uh, listen to our guest speaker, but I am gonna show you where you can find the guidelines. They are on our website, uh, which is pw.org. And you will find them here under readings and workshops. And if you go to the application guidelines, it should come up. <laughs> it's a little slow on my computer. Um, so here they are, easy to find on our website under funding for events. So I just wanted to show you that and make sure you knew where to find them. Um, I will highlight some of the big changes. Um, really, the application process is exactly the same as it's always been. An organization must apply on behalf of a writer. However, um, one of the changes is that whereas before we were requiring organizations to submit applications six to eight weeks in advance of an event, we've shortened that to four weeks. Um, so that we can quickly adjust and fund the events that you have coming up. If your event is a little bit shy of that four week deadline, don't hesitate to get in touch with us and find out if you might still be able to um, qualify for funding. So um, just email me or call me and I can help you out, hopefully. Um, one of the other important changes is that we are waiving the matching requirement. So we no longer are asking sponsors to uh, match what they're asking of us. Um, so if you want to apply for a $100 grant to fund a writer, you don't have to have an, your own $100 to match. Um, and then lastly, if if you do get approved for a grant, um, normally we would mail the check to you as the sponsor to give to the writer at the event. Um, but because everybody is sheltering in place, we will be mailing checks directly to the writers. And um, that is going to be about two weeks after the event has taken place. So those are some of the big um, changes in our guidelines. But otherwise, everything is the same as it was before. And um, I hope that you'll apply for any virtual events that you are doing here in California. Um, and if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to me. Um, the, e the easiest email is rw-west at pw.org. So now I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Cody Sisko. Um, Cody is going to be talking about his experience conducting live virtual readings. Um, he does a multitude of things, um, and that's just one of them. First, I'm going to read his bio. I'm going to do the honor, honor him by reading his bio. Cody Sisko is an author, publisher, and literary community organizer. Yay, we love literary community organizers. <laughs> His Resonant Earth series includes two novels thus far, Broken Mirror and Tortured Echoes. Cody is the 2017 Los Angeles Review of Books, USC Publishing Workshop Fellow, 
a co-organizer of the Los Angeles Writers Critique Group and a founding member of Made in LA Writers. His startup, Bookswell, connects readers with authors, maintains a literary events calendar, and serves as a community hub for book lovers in LA. Cody has also been a regular attendee of many of our literary roundtable meetings, and I thought he would be the perfect person to speak to you today about uh, virtual live readings, tips, things to watch out for, and the like. So take it away, Cody. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Jamie, for organizing this and making this happen. Hello. Um, it's fun to see so many people and like a little glimpse of your private lives <laughs> and a glimpse of mine too. Um, so before I start, uh, I just want to say that storytelling is essential. We all know that as writers, but uh, you know, for everyone out there right now, the stories that we tell and share are going to be um, even more impactful than usual. So. Um, what we have left to us is to have these live readings since we can't be in person. Um, and so to think of it in that spirit where we're bringing something to, into the world that um, is greatly needed. Um, though I'll cover kind of like two main aspects in the talk today. The first is um, the experiences I've had with live readings and Bookswell over the past year and a half and then some tips for you. So we'll get very um, specific on how you can organize or participate in live literary readings uh, virtually. Um, I started Bookswell around in 2017 um, with a pretty modest idea, and that was that there were so many events happening in the literary space in LA every day, three, four, five, sometimes as many as seven. And um, while the community here is really tightly knit, uh, it's a challenge to to get into it. Um, if you're a newbie or if, even if you're just like a casual reader who wanted to go see your favorite author, it wasn't easy to find all the information about all these events. So with Bookswell, I just started compiling them and putting them up on the website. And um, it kind of evolved incrementally over time to include more um, original content. And our idea was to amplify the voices of writers from marginalized communities and to make every event that we were part of kind of live longer and bigger online. So the, the idea from the, the start was to kind of enhance real life uh, literary readings and, and make them and bring at least a part of them online. So this first started um, last year when we started the Bookswell Intersections podcast. And I think it was at um, it was at a Poets and Writers Roundtable in South Pasadena where I met um, Seba Sarwar, and she had then agreed to come on the podcast, and we had a really good conversation about her book Black Wings. Um, but starting from about then on, in addition to recording the audio, we would sometimes record some video and share that afterwards, um, and we would kind of excerpt those pieces and share them on social media so that um, people could get you know a glimpse into the podcast. Um, and then around September of last year uh, was the first start at doing um, more video. So uh, Tori Eldridge had a book launch for the Ninja Daughter and she invited me in to record it. And she's got this you know, super engaging personality and, um, and background in entertainment. So that was great. I got to um, record some interviews with her and her, um, her writer friends. Um, and she kind of introduced me to the, the crime uh, writers in LA, and that kind of led to one gig after another. So um, when pa Patricia Smith had her um, book launch at a hotel, very swanky event where she had set up a red carpet and sort of went all out to make this big party, um, she had Bookswell there, and we were doing interviews with her family and friends and kind of compiled all those into a video that she could share after the event um, that helped sort of, you know, raise her profile in the community and, and give people a glimpse of it if they weren't able to go. And then earlier this year, um, how many of you have heard of Wendy Hurd? She wrote The Kill Club. It's a, yeah, it's a, <laughs> I saw Desiree raise her hand. Uh, it's a great, um, 
crime thriller um, with a lesbian protagonist, and it's 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 a real it, it's so LA, um, and so she she had me there, and but she is um, the co-host of a podcast, so you know she was able to do the interviews herself, and she kind of made it um, into a thing that she could then share that way. And then in early February, late January, early February. Slouching Towards Los Angeles came out, which was um, a lot of writers' uh, essays in reaction to Joan Didion and all of her writing. And so it was a take on um, their inspirations uh, and their reactions, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Um, and they did a series of events around town and we helped kind of um, do some coverage and media around that. So that's kind of the trajectory I was heading was like, oh, there are these events that are great and we want to like, give them a little boost and make them a little bit more, live, make them live a little bit more in the audiovisual realm. And then of course, everything changed in March with all of the events at local bookstores being canceled. Um, and you know, that was just, I took a pause and was like, what the hell is going on? I'm kind of still in that <laughs> mindset. Um, but so, you know, the podcast, we started doing it remotely and um, I had this really intense like need to somehow stay engaged and to not just be isolated at home on my own, but to figure out a way to continue continue a literary life, you know, even while sort of sealed away. And um, the first experience, I, I put together a kind of video literary salon. This was like the second week of the stay at home order in um, LA. And it was, um, it was me, Sarah Chisholm and Noriko Nakata, um, who was published in Women Who Submit. Many of you, I think, probably know her. We just had like a long conversation about like how we were doing and our stories and we shared poetry and it was really, really nice. Um, but I think it was a little too early. I think people were still uh, coming to grips with what was going on and adapting and, and, and like it was too soon. Um, but we, we continued with that, the read and relate salon that Bookswell puts together is now um, every two to four weeks, depending. And we've had um, a few of them. So we had uh, one with Ruben Teehee Hazlett and um, Lisa Kastner, who's the publisher over at Running Wild Press. Um, we've had uh, Mariana Zaro, Alicia Elcourt, Stephen Rains, and Kim Dower um, do a poetry themed one. That was about two weeks ago. Uh, and we have one tomorrow night um, with Nisi Shawl, Cecil Castellucci, who's local, Kate Maruyama, who's the guest host, and um, and a few other writers too. And um, and so you know, each one of these has evolved a little bit, um, making the best of what we can do with the technology that we have. And um, what I want to do today is kind of share what I've learned. <laughs> through that process, uh, bit by bit, um, and leave you with a message that whether you're participating or organizing it on your own, this is all stuff that you can do and figure out um, in order to share your writing with the world. So, um, and also, um, I can share my contact info if there's if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them later. But we can get into that today too. Okay, so we're going to talk about tips how to do this. Um, and I decided, you know, what, what's true now is that some things haven't changed and some things have. So we'll start with the things that haven't changed, the things that go into doing a successful event that are even more important now that we're all kind of virtual heads speaking via the internets. Um, I think like number one, it's important to think about what your goals are for the event. Like, it's totally a reasonable and great goal to say, I wanna connect with my writer friends and have a conversation online. And maybe some people can participate and watch and that's great. Um, other types of goals would be, you know what, I want to introduce a new writer into a community so that they can be heard when their voice is new and hasn't been heard yet. Um, or it could be to have a discussion to kind of further an agenda, which is, somewhat what we're doing tomorrow night with the Writing Better Futures um, session, where we're gonna be talking about like, what is the writer's responsibility to imagine a better world in order to help 
um, make it happen. So, so all that to say, it's really important to think about what you want to get out of the event and to consider that up front. Likewise, it's very important to, to carefully craft the theme that you want to address to think about who's participating and how they're going to represent certain topics or ideas or motifs or genres. Um, and to come up with both a, a name for it and a description that are interesting, that are going to clearly tell people what they're going to get. <laughs> um, it's, it's important that the audience knows what to expect, right, before they show up. Like, what gets them interested? How do you hook them? Those are all still really important. It's even more important now because you can't just like show up at Skylight and be like, I know something cool is going to happen. I'll enjoy it no matter what. Like it, it, we have more options these days and we have more distractions these days too. Um, one thing I suggest which has worked out really well is to involve the participants early on in shaping the event. So what I will do typically is, is come up with an idea, a rough idea of the title or the description and who I want to participate, and then ask them, who else should we get on board? Um, give me your edits for this description. I want, to I want it to be the best it can be. What, you know, what should we add? What should we take away? Um, that's true also of the logistics. Like, when should this happen? When is convenient? <laughs> Making sure people can show up. So involving them early and being pretty clear about um, what's expected and how it's going to work. Um, and then the audience. That one, you know, as writers, we're all about expressing ourselves. We're all about uh, putting our ideas into words and sharing them. We're, we don't necessarily think about it with a marketing brain. Um, and so uh, that one's always the challenge for me is to take a step back and say, okay, who do I want to reach? Who would benefit from, from the reading? Who, wants, who, who would be sad to miss out on this person's poetry? Um, and then figure out a way to reach them. Um, there's a lot of different ways to reach people, either through social media or through email newsletters or websites. But thinking about you know, where, especially now that we can't get together in person, you can't put a, um, a flyer up at your local coffee shop, or you can't just, you know, Beyond Baroque isn't having any literary readings right now. Hopefully they resume soon. But with those options kind of off the table, we have to be a little bit smarter about using the online resources we have in order to reach the people that we want to reach. So think about your audience. And then finally, um, sharing as much information as far in advance as you can about the event. So that means, you know, putting it up on the Poets and Writers literary calendar. Um, you could put it up on Eventbrite. You could put it into Facebook groups. I mean, there's a lot of ways, but um, being as, um, putting it out there as much as possible is important. Um, it helps to have a good graphic, you know, that looks good, that maybe has a couple names mentioned or maybe some smiling faces. <laughs> um, but, but just making sure that, that people know when it's happening. Um, and something that a lot of people don't think about is like, you could share it a week in advance. By the time the event comes around, people have forgotten. So, so you have to share it the day in advance. You've got to share it an hour in advance. You've got to make sure that people have the link the moment before the meeting starts so that they can just click and come in. You want to reduce all of the barriers to accessing the event as possible. Um, yeah. So those are mostly things that haven't changed. Um, I want to talk now specifically about organizing these things online. I've, I've kind of veered into some of this, but um, I've got a few more tips. And then we'll definitely have a lot of time for Q&A. If you have specific questions, you know, we'll, we'll get into them. Um, what's really important to consider online is what level of audience interaction do you want to have? Um, we could have, for example, started this session with a question to you all, like, tell us what, you're, what you want to know and put it in the chat or, you know, let's go around and do an introduction. Those are all options for how you want to run your event. Um, I have lately veered towards less engagement um, because I think that there's a need for events like literary readings where you can just show up and watch and let the words roll over you and enjoy it. And you don't have to be on 
You don't have to have your camera on. Um, you can just enjoy it and not have it be difficult. That's kind of my personal bias lately in how to organize events. But um, on the other hand, when we did the Made in LA event, that was super interactive and really rewarding because we got into some great discussions where it was conversations back and forth between a dozen people. So think about what level of interaction you want to have and then plan the event accordingly. Um, another example, I, I attended, um, I guess you'd call it a webinar, but it was a literary reading online. Um, and it was done via the Crowdcast platform. And it was um, Amy Liu introducing her new book, Glorious Boy, last night. And it was great. I mean, she's phenomenal. Um, and I was just like listening the whole time being like, wow, I could listen to you for hours. Um, but there was, you know, there was an opportunity to ask questions and raise your hand um, that are built into that platform. And so that was, that was nice because um, the moderator did a really great job of fielding those questions. So anyway, that's a long drawn out way of saying, think about your, um, your interaction from the start. I like to put together an agenda, um, even if it's rough, you know, a minute of introductions, a minute of um, setting the scene and then getting into the discussion, whatever, you know, however you want the event to run, create an agenda, share it with all the participants. Um, you can include some technical notes too, like at this point, everyone will be muted and then we'll unmute or um, will be, you know, it's advised that you have it on gallery view versus speaker view, those kinds of things. Um, because all of the stuff that we take for granted in an in-person meeting doesn't really apply. Like all of our interactions right now are mediated by this platform and the technology and whether we've got a good microphone or, or speakers. So the more you can put your participants at ease and have a plan for how it works, I think that in, in the end, you know, the fewer surprises, the better. Um, this is also really important if you plan on recording and sharing afterwards, because what you want to do with a recording is make sure you're capturing the moments of action closely and the things that don't matter, you don't really want in the frame. Um, the first, the read and relate we did with Made in LA where we had about 45 participants via Zoom and then um, some more on Facebook Live at the same time. I, I learned a lot <laughs> during that event because, you know, we had people on camera like walking around, you could see their background shifting. You saw like a, a virtual house tour. Um, we had some people who were trying to make trouble and disrupt and, you know, they were like making faces at the camera and we caught onto it and kicked them out. But um, for a little while it was, it was disruptive. So, um, Definitely important to think about those things in advance. Um, and here, okay, next point. I think you guys are all gonna have questions about this and I'll do my best to answer them um, when we get to that. But choose your platform wisely. We're all on Zoom right now. Um, what's, what's great about Zoom is that it allows interactivity and everyone can kind of sign on and be on camera and, and all of that is good. Um, but there's lots of other options. I mentioned Crowdcast, um, Facebook Live. Um, I, did, I did a reading with Shonda Buchanan on Instagram Live, which was interesting because um, it was kind of on her Instagram phone. So she's, you know, she's like here in the top half and then um, she invites someone in, they appear on the bottom half, and it's kind of like a little conversation on your phone. And then she can like say, okay, thank you, bye. And like get that person out of there and bring someone else on. So that was a, that was a really interesting way to do it. And I think um, a lot of people spend so much time on Instagram that it may be a good way to get a big audience. Um, there's YouTube Live, which I haven't ever used. Um, some of these are difficult when you have multiple um, participants in various places. Um, but, you know, all of these platforms have different options, different drawbacks, different um, advantages. So it's kind of like figure out which one's right for the event you want to have. And it does help if you build up some experience with each one, because there's always kind of surprises and things that when you learn about them, you do it the next time and it's not a problem. But that first time was like, oh, kind of scary. Um, yeah, so 
along those lines, always read the, like sometimes there's a FAQ, sometimes there's a guidebook, sometimes there's video tutorials. Just familiarize yourself with those in advance so that you, you know, you at least have the, the basic understanding of, of what to look out for. I'm a big fan of running a practice session, particularly if you think, if you haven't used the platform before, or if you think your participants haven't, get them together and run a practice session. Just, you know, make sure everything's working the way you expect it to. Um, I'm almost at the end of my tips, so this is fun. We'll get to have some, some questions. Um, starting about last year, I, I, I uh, maybe I overthought it, but I started looking into microphones and video cameras and looking at like some of the technical capabilities and just really kind of digging in because I wanted to create quality content for Bookswell. We're in a different era now where <laughs> everyone's connecting with whatever they have. And I think we're all less uptight about it as well. But some of the things you can do is if you have a microphone, that's great, use it. Um, definitely earbuds are good for stopping any sort of feedback issues and making sure that the, you know, there's none of that happening. Um, good lighting is important. I've got this little thing. I think I paid like $5 for it. It's a USB powered um, ring light. Um, and you just like pop it up there and then suddenly it evens out all the weird um, lighting issues you might have in your place. So just minor things, you know, it, they're not important, they're nice to have, but it's, it's something. Um, and then this last point is, I think, for me, this is like kind of why I started Bookswell, but it's consider how to make the content live beyond the event itself. You know, we, we, we put all this, <laughs> we actually, uh, Poets and Writers supported our event um, last year for Lambda Lit Fest. We uh, got together um, a reading that was queer writers of color and then a discussion among community members on how we continue to amplify these voices. And, um, you know, it was, we put in all this work for the event, but we wanted to make sure how do we make this live on? Like, it could come and go and people would never know about it. So we made sure to record it. We put it up on YouTube. Um, we tried to have uh, discussions on social media to follow up on the points that were raised. So, so I'd say with any event, think about how, what's the day after? What's the day after the day after? How do you stay in touch with the people who are panelists or readers? How do you continue the conversation um, onward up until the next event? Because, you know, there's a lot of, frankly, um, boring or incendiary stuff on social media, why don't we fill it up with all of the great things that we have to say and discuss and talk about with our work? You know, like, we're the ones who should be doing it. We're the writers. So um, that's my last tip. Thank you so much. That was a, that was a great last tip. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, let's fill social media up with all the good stuff um, that we're doing. So um, I'm going to open it up to questions uh, for Cody. Um, and just in general, if you have other things to add to what he said. So if you have a question, um, you can type it into the chat or you can use the raise hand function and Dan Tran and I will both do our best to call on as many of you as we can. I see a hand raised from Liz. So I'll ask Dan Tran to unmute Liz Gonzalez. Okay. Hi, Liz. Hi. I actually just had uh, just a couple of extra tips that I learned from participating in um, readings and on uh, virtual readings. And one is a virtual reading that I participated in. They were showing it on, it was through Zoom, but they showed it on Facebook and the person had it on the wrong channel. So mm -hmm. making sure that the tech puts it on the right channel. And then the other thing is, is um, I, I, uh, I have my chronic migraines and light triggers my migraines. And so when you are presenting 
on Zoom to be careful not to have a blaring, you know, spotlight coming from behind you because people have sensitive, people who don't have migraines have sensitive eyes and it, it can, uh, you know, put people off. Ah! So that, those are just the two things. So thank you so much for your presentation, Cody. It's very helpful, very informative. Thank you. Yeah, that Facebook Live one kind of gives me nightmares. Um, it's the the in, the the connection point between Zoom and Facebook Live is difficult to set up. It's easy in the sense that like if you start a Zoom meeting and then just find the option and say go live on Facebook, that's pretty straightforward. But people don't know about that in advance. So for example, for the event tomorrow night, you can schedule a Facebook Live event and connect it into Zoom but the process is a little bit tricky. Um, there's like a, a stream key and different URLs that you have to like put in the right boxes and everything has to line up to make it happen. But the advantage is once you have it set up that that's an access to a much bigger audience um, and, and easy for people to, um, to show up and enjoy it. I see Devorah with their hand up. So I'm going to unmute them. Hi Devorah. Hi. Um, you mentioned a few different uh, platforms and you said there are pluses and minuses to each. I'm wondering if you could give a plus and a minus for CrowdShare and Facebook Live and Instagram Live, you know, not all, but, you know, but a plus and a minus. So we have a sense yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, so the, the Crowdcast one that I mentioned um, last night uh, has a couple things that I thought were pretty cool. Um, it has a buy button. So if I clicked through on that event, I would be taken to the Diesel Books um, organized it. I'd be taken to the Diesel Books website for the page for Amy Lewis' book, Glorious Boy, and I could mm. buy it at that point. And they were also doing something really cool. They were um, personalizing the dedications that came through from that event. So if you showed up to her event, you listened to her talk and you bought her book, you could get a little personalized dedication from her, which I thought was really nice. Mm -hmm. um, the Q and A was about the same. Like the there's like specific places where you can input questions that the moderator sees that they can reverse or revert to the um, presenter. Um, so overall, you know, great platform. What I would I guess I should back up. One of the um, main pluses or minuses for all of these is cost. Um, you know, there are free options. Um, those are not free is not always free. <laughs> <laughs> in that you're giving them away free content and supporting their platform. So things like YouTube or Facebook, you know, like you're not, you're not paying for the use of that, but then you're also kind of creating their economy of attention. Um, Zoom has a free option. Zoom also has a paid option and the, like has many tiers of paid options. Um, for tomorrow's event, I ended up springing for the webinar um, plan because I wanted to have it be really sleek and have all the presenters show up really well and, and, and have it be nice <laughs> and have it look good. Um, so cost is an issue, um, audience is an issue. Like does, it, does using that platform actually bring in the audience that you want to have? You know, some, some content is better for certain platforms. I'd say if you've got poetry, Instagram is a great place to be for poetry. People, you know, they want to they, they want to have that kind of nice experience, feeling. They want to be moved. Um, so yeah, so each each platform is really about like the the cost, the audience, um, and then the technical kind of management of it. Some are easier to use than others. Um, and like I said, I haven't used YouTube Live, so I can't speak to that specifically, but. Um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say like it depends on the type of event you want to have also. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to read a question in the chat from Laird Harrison. Cody, you mentioned problems with people moving their cameras around and with disruptors. How have you prevented these problems in subsequent events? Yeah, so I think about it like this. Um, who needs to have their camera on for the audience to have a good experience? If it's something like a town hall where we all want to be interacting and talking to each other, like we need to have our cameras on, we need to be able to, to speak. Um, but if it's a reading where what you really want to do is hear from an author and hear the moderator interacting with the author, not everyone's camera needs to be on. 
So, um, I mean, specifically after that, I wouldn't say after that challenging Made in LA experience <laughs> where, I mean, when I edited that video, I had to just like block out some of the squares to make sure that the disruptive um, cameras just couldn't be seen. Um, I, I made sure that um, in the subsequent event that we had uh, with um, Lisa and, and Ruben Teehee Hazlett and the podcast co-hosts that only the videos were only the video feeds were on for those people who would be sharing. And then when we got to the Q and A, we did it via the chat. So um, thinking about, you know, like, do we need to see this video feed or who needs to be on the video feed and at what time also, I think is important. But that's a good question because um, I learned a lot from <laughs> one challenging experience. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? I'm looking for hands. I see, I see a hand from Sherry, so I'm going to unmute. Great. Hi, Sherry. Hi, thank you for, for your uh, presentation today. I wanna go back to um, before the tips, you were talking about a graphic. You want to make a graphic that will catch people's eyes with the names. But then you said you're not going to share the link until a few days before. So you're not actually inviting the public in. You're sending a link to people who are people who have been in your group before. Or who do you send the link to? I've, it's a good question. I've done it different ways. Um, so if I want to have the, the biggest audience possible, I want to make sure that the, the link to join is widely available. Um, so in that case, um, what I'll do is put it in the event description. So if I post it to Poets and Writers or to Eventbrite or to the Bookswell website, I'll include the link there. So there's no action that they need to take in advance to RSVP or register. They just click their link at the time of the meeting and they're, they're in the meeting. Um, what we're doing a little bit differently for the event tomorrow is that um, the link to join the Zoom webinar is available if you register via Eventbrite. So you, know, you go to the listing page on Eventbrite, people sign up in RSVP, they're emailed the link and they can join that way because that has a maximum capacity of 100. Um, I'm also sharing though broadly the Facebook Live link. So anyone can join via Facebook Live and that information on where to find that is already out there. So long-winded way of saying, um, I think it's best to share the, the login entrance information as far in advance as possible and in the lead up to the event as much as possible. So we have a writer's group and we have a re reoccurring uh, event every Wednesday. So that link is out there and it can be shared with the other people and, and our writers know to just show up on that particular time and day. Do you have a recurring meeting where you could share a link and we could go there and watch whoever it is you're um, talking to on that day? Yeah, there's, for Facebook Live, there's one link that, that will show every event that we do there. Um, I can pop that into the chat in a second. Um, and so every, every time we go on Facebook Live, the same link will take you to that. Um, but it's not a definite time, Wednesdays, 4.30, every single no, Wednesday. No, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Right. So especially for the read and relate, um, they tend to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, around 6 or 7 p.m., but they shift based on the availability of the participants, right? Okay. So we're, we're, we're assembling a panel and we just figure out, like, does Wednesday work? Okay, let's do it. Um, but we're kind of, so it's, uh, no, that, that's a really good question. The um, we started collaborating with the um, Exposition Park 
regional branch of the um, Los Angeles Public Library. And he just emailed me the question yesterday saying, you know, should we have this at a regular time? Um, and my answer is, I mean, like, well, what I'll email him is like, yeah, that's nice, but sometimes we gotta move it around just because, you know, sometimes things get in the way. Life okay. gets in the way. <laughs> Yeah. Cody, I, I have a question for you, Cody, about the Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. I've never used it, so I, I think my question might be beneficial to other people as well who haven't used it, but you, do you create a channel? So you were saying that it's always the same link when you use Facebook Live? Yeah, so um, what I've done is use it via the, the Bookswell page on Facebook. Um, I think it works differently if you're doing it from your own like profile. Um, I haven't looked into that. Um, but like, for example, if the Poets and Writers did it via their Facebook Live, if they, I'm sure Poets and Writers has a page on Facebook. Um, there's a, what they call it a persistent link. There's a persistent link to live content that, that could be the one that you share over and over and over again. And it just matters that people use it at the right time. When, the, when it's happening, when it is live. <laughs> There's a question from Judy Reeves. I was on a Zoom reading where the link was made public and we were Zoom bombed, which was pretty ugly. How do you handle a Zoom link and share it broadly? Judy, I'm sorry that happened to you. I, there's there people, you know, some people are great, some are not. <laughs> and and we're, I think we're also seeing a lot of like odd behavior because the world is stressed right now. And also there's just, there are trolls online and we have to watch out for them. Um, there's a real tension between wanting to have an audience and wanting to make sure that that audience is not gonna misbehave. Um, you can set it up so that only people with the password can join and you can set it up so that um, as the host, uh, attendees come into a waiting room and individually you let them into the meeting. So that would be one way of making sure that only people that you know come into the meeting. Um, I didn't take that approach with the Made in LA group because I was excited to have an audience. <laughs> I was like, oh, we've gotten like people who want to hear us. Like, that's great. Um, but then, you know, then there were drawbacks to that. And you know, all of these platforms have like ins and outs and ways to manage it that are not ideal for all of the infinite situations we are trying to recreate online. But for Zoom in particular, yeah, you can control exactly who gets into your meeting. And you know, it, you can even do things like um, have them when they register in advance, if they have to answer a question, you know that if they answered the question, they care enough and are probably gonna be reasonable when they get there or they're just gonna be super malicious and then what can you do? You can't really control for that. But the nice thing is you can always kick them out. So if someone, you know, and this is why I always like to have a co-host. Like if I'm often, you know, trying to look at the participant list and figure out, okay, who's here, what's happening, everything good. I'll have a co-host who's like more on the um, content side or, or just keeping an eye on things as well. Um, but yeah, if I have a pretty short, um, fuse <laughs> in a way, if someone is being disruptive or disrespectful and doing things that are clearly unacceptable, I'll just kick them out. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, I'll chime in um, on that, Cody. And second, um, the advice to have a co-host or have somebody, if possible, with you managing the event um, who can take care of things that you might not be able to manage, especially if you're facilitating. For instance, I have Dan Tran who's helping me with the sort of technical background stuff and with this discussion. So thank you, Dan Tran. <laughs> um, so yeah, I second that. And also um, you can, at least in Zoom, you can um, ban somebody from the meeting if they're being disruptive. And there's an option, um that you have to set up in advance to allow or disallow uh, people to rejoin. Um, and there's pros and cons with that too. If you accidentally kick out someone, 
you want to be there and then they can't get back in. That's a problem, but um, it prevents people from coming back in if you've gotten rid of a problem person. So, you know, none of the, I just meta advice, none of this is ideal and you kind of manage as you go and it helps to just remain calm and have a plan and, and adapt as things come up and keep a good uh, attitude about it. Judy, I saw you raise your hand, so I'm going to unmute you. I just wanted to say that I that we use the Zoom for us, a group that we do weekly writing practice sessions with. But I but I've never opened it up to the public and you you know to advertise it broadly using a Zoom. So that's why I was concerned about that. The other way that we yeah. do it now, extending that like like Jimmy did for us today, has worked very well for us with that. But I was just concerned about the broader audience. So this is all good, especially having a, a co-host and someone who can punch buttons when you're managing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 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 Monitoring the chat for sure is important. Yeah. But for, you know, for bad, but also for good, like, you know, often the, that's where the questions come in. So. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. There's a question from Ruth Nolan. Cody, do you have any suggestions for a good time length and max number of readers for virtual events? I do, yeah. Um, <laughs> So I always like to think about, even, even like in-person events, I always like to think about what is, what is the entertainment and soul nourishing value of um, reading versus discussion? Because, you know, we've had some conversations about this on the Bookswell podcast with the co-hosts that it's great to hear the writer's voice and it's great to hear their words and to be inside of their work especially for poetry, but also for, you know, fiction. Um, and some people like just, that's all they want, but I don't know, it's a personal preference. I think that the story behind the story and, um, and the discussion is often more interesting. That's the audience, like that's audience perspective. Um, so, you know, I would say limiting, you know, depending on the amount of time you have, um, overall, I think an hour is plenty, plenty. <laughs> We're, you know, we all sign up to these things and um, that can be a lot. Sometimes, you know, half an hour or 45 minutes is fine. Um, and with, with some of the platforms like, um, like Instagram, you know, I would, if you went on live for like 15 minutes, that's fine. Like that's, that's a good chunk of time. So think about like how, how much time do people want to be spending in that, call it a venue, but on that platform. Um, yeah, so when we do the books well, read and relate, we, we try not to go over an hour. Um, our target's like four or five participants. Tomorrow night, because we had such amazing interest, um, we've got technically five guests and two co-hosts, but it's really seven people. Um, so we won't really be reading at all. We'll be talking um, about books and inspiration and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Thank you. There's a question from Naomi in the chat. How long are Cody's events? Does Cody collect feedback from participants? Ooh. If so, how is it done? That is really good. Um, I don't have a formal process for collecting feedback. Um, I took part in a writer's workshop, like a one day writer's workshop recently, and they've sent me persistently so many forms to fill out to give them feedback and I'm like I don't know if that experience merits it like so you know I'm I'm very careful about how I ask people to use their time maybe I should be less so um but so I don't have a process for collecting feedback about the events I will check in though with the participants and ask them how do you think it went um you know was there something we could have done better uh, you know what was your read on the audience and um and sometimes you don't have to ask. When we did the, the poetry event um, with Mariano Zaro and Stephen Raines and Kim Dower and others, um, the chat was beautiful. People were putting in the chat, like, I love your poem so much, or like asking questions, like so much positive feedback came in as the event was going on that I was like, cool, like we did a great job, fine, no worries. Um, you know, after the Made in LA one, I did, check in with people and you know everyone was like yeah that was kind of screwy with those guys who tried to disrupt us but we handled it well and it was a great conversation so no harm no foul um so definitely you know ask 
the participants how it went. Um, yeah, depending on the type of event and what type of feedback you want, you might do something more formal. Um, I always think, you know, if if you get some interaction on social media, if people are liking, commenting, retweeting, doing whatever, if it's if it's causing a, a reaction that's not <laughs> painful, um, you probably did a good job. You know, a lot of a lot of these things, and you know, don't feel bad if there's not a lot of that. Um, some events come and go, and like they just don't create a big splash. You, you keep trying. Um, yeah. Well, terrific. I think that's probably all the time we have for um, Q and A. I wanted to keep this meeting to about an hour. Um, so thank you so much, Cody, for your insightful and really clear presentation and for answering everyone's questions. That was really helpful. Um, if anyone has feedback, I send me some... feedback. <laughs> yeah, put your feedback in the chat. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I just learned that. <laughs> so um, with the last few minutes, I just wanted to uh, share with you a few resources uh, that you might might be aware of um, but might also need to be reminded of. I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, these are some things that Poets and Writers offers. Um, one, of, one of the things that I'm really um, proud of Poets and Writers for doing is in response to uh, COVID-19, Poets and Writers Board of Directors um, approved funding for writers in need. Um, we have made grants of $107,000 to 107 writers. Um, that program currently is closed, but there may be another round of funding coming up. So just be sure to check our website for details if um, that is something that you might be interested in applying for. Um, there are some limits to who can apply, um, but like I said, um, you can check our website for that info. And I will be sending this list out to uh, the folks who were invited to the meeting. So look out for that, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, we also have a wonderful article that is being added to on a regular basis by our editorial staff called Resources for Writers in the Time of Coronavirus. Um, and this is just a really um, helpful list for writers, teachers, and publishers and booksellers. Um, there are a lot of financial resources listed there, among other things. If you have any trouble staying inspired or, you know, keeping your writing going during this time, you might be interested in our free writing prompts, which get sent weekly. They're called The Time Is Now. What better time to write than now, right? <laughs> so you can <laughs> sign up for those uh, on our website and have them delivered to your inbox. Um, lots of other things to keep you inspired on pw.org, craft capsules, which are micro essays that explore the finer points of writing, writers recommend. Um, we have a submission calendar. It's a great resource for writers who are looking to submit their work. Um, it has all of the deadlines for upcoming contests and awards. Um, we also have uh, the GNA contest blog, grants and awards contest blog. Um, which spots li spotlights financial opportunities for writers. Um, you can visit our databases of literary magazines and small presses to find markets for your work. If you are not listed in our directory of writers and think you might qualify, um, check that out. It's a good time to apply. If you're listed in our directory, you would that would qualify you for Say if you wanted to apply for the COVID-19 relief fund, if you're in the directory of writers, then you would automatically be able to apply. Um, we have daily news to keep you up to date on all things literary. And then of course, our literary events calendar, which Cody mentioned, I encourage you to post all of your events there. It can now handle uh, 
virtual live events. So check it out if you have events and also post to Cody's uh, calendar books well. Um, some other resources that um, might be helpful, just these are some platforms for virtual live event presentation that I've heard of. Zoom, Google Hangouts, Blue Jeans, Cisco WebEx, Crowdcast, which I think Cody mentioned, StreamYard, um, Join Me, Free Conference Call. There are some workshops that are just happening on the phone um, very successfully. So um, you can check out those services. Um, also, if you're looking for things to read, your public library probably has e-lending options. There's a wonderful app called Overdrive which connects you to public libraries across the country. I use it all the time to get free books on my Kindle. And last but not least, um, the NEA has information about increasing the accessibility of your virtual events. Um, so I've included a link to that. And again, I'll send these out to you um, after the meetings have concluded. Um, so with that, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for joining us today. If you have any questions for me after the meeting, feel free to send me an email. I'm going to type my email address into the chat. You can reach me here or at rwwest at pw.org. And I just wanted to um, encourage you to apply for funding in California if you're doing virtual live events. And um, Dara is asking, where can we get that form of resources? Um, I will email it to everyone um, who registered today. So um, you'll be getting that soon. And with that, I'd like to close the meeting out and wish you all well, good health, stay safe, stay home, and stay inspired. Thank you.